Hi class, welcome to your breed identification project. So for this project, you'll be keeping your breed identification notebook. And in order to do that, you're going to have a series of videos on different large animal breeds that are important to the industry around here. So for that, each of these videos is usually going to start off with some background information on that particular sector of the industry. So for this week, we're talking about beef breeds. So we're gonna talk about the beef industry a little bit. And when we do that, we're either going to be talking about important qualities that we need to distinguish between the different breeds and why someone would pick a certain breed over another one. Or in some cases, it's gonna be more general information about the industry. And I take this opportunity to um, kind of tell you a little bit about some of the practices that go on in each individual industry. Since our units in this class aren't really arranged as, you know, just beef or just pork or whatever the industry might be. While you're doing the background information piece, you're going to take notes on the pages that I've provided to you. Um, so there are certain definitions and things like that that you'll need to write down. And then you're also going to um, be going into a section that goes over your breeds for the week. And the way we're going to split this up is we're going to do 10 breeds every two weeks. Um, and that way it gives you the opportunity, if you have more time one week than another, you can kind of split up how you want to work on it. You're going to use these videos where we go over each breed to start your breed ID notebooks. If I mention it in the video, it's probably pretty important to have in your notebook and you can probably expect to see it on the quiz. And then at the end of that two week period, your breeds are going to be due for those 10 breeds. So there will be notebook checks where I just make sure that you are all caught up. And then you will also be taking a quiz where you can identify the different types of breeds. So you want to make sure you really focus on what they look like and what some of those identifying characteristics are. On the quizzes, you will get both a question that has some of those characteristics, and you'll also get usually several pictures to help you identify that breed. So we've talked a little bit already on what the difference is between a species and a breed. And a species is any two animals that are closely related genetically to the point that they can reproduce and have viable offspring. Breeds are more specific. They have certain traits that have been bred for over and over. Um, and there's usually a registry that keeps track of all of the different um, animals that are considered part of that breed. And that's where you'd register your purebreds. There's also a new idea here called a composite breed. So this could also be known as a crossbreed. But basically, this is when you take two or more breeds and you cross them in a very specific ratio. And that's because by crossing them that way, you're going to be able to get the traits that you want. Um, and then they keep maintaining that ratio and they keep breeding them that way over and over, just like it was a purebred line. So you're going to see a composite breed here with your beef breeds this week. Um, and the reason that they usually make composite breeds is to introduce hybrid vigor. So that's also called heterosis. And the whole point of hybrid vigor is it's kind of like if you've had a dog that's a mutt, you may have noticed that sometimes they're a little bit healthier than purebreds. And that's not just an observation, that's a real trend. Um, whenever we hybrid, whenever we have a hybrid of different breeds, or even different species sometimes, they tend to be more robust and healthier than the purebred ones. And it's because they have better genetic diversity and there's no inbreeding at all. And at that point, they really are able to avoid a lot of those genetic disorders. So in this example here, they're using the Senapal breed and they're basically showing you that it's made up of all of these different breeds combined in this exact ratio. You're going to see a composite breed later on called the Brangus breed. And same kind of idea, it's a couple different breeds combined. Since we're talking about beef, um, the end result for all beef cattle is we want to harvest them for meat. So one of the most important uh, selection criteria when you're trying to decide on a breed of beef cow um, is carcass quality. 
And that's really a rating of how desirable the meat is. And a lot goes into that, and it's actually quite complicated, but basically there are some major things they want to look at, like the weight that you're going to get of the actual carcass, um, and what percentage of that is going to be called your dressing percentage, if you remember that from freshman year. That's how much meat you're actually getting out of the animal, and then the rest would go towards byproducts and things like that. Then there's also a grade assigned to all beef. For instance, it might be prime, it might be choice, and that's based on a lot of other factors, one of which is marbling, and that's the amount of intermuscular fat that you have inside of the muscle. Um, and then that's a little bit different than the fat thickness around the muscle. So when we're talking the thickness of back fat, that's in general on the back of the cow, um, but you can also have this extra um, muscular fat surrounding the cut of meat. And that all goes into the grade as well. You wanna know um, what's going to be basically the end um, profit from this cow. So that's really what carcass quality is all about, is being able to estimate that. If you're a farmer, another really important thing for you is going to be feed efficiency because you need to know, be able to calculate how much money can you actually make by raising this animal and is it worth it? So the more feed efficient an animal is, the more profit you can get from it uh, because the feed efficiency is basically a ratio of how much you need to feed the animal for that animal to reach market weight um, and in order for it to yield the most meat or the most milk that it can. And this is a pretty simple calculation. You take the amount of feed that it takes to raise that animal all the way through to adulthood, and you divide it by the edible product that you get out of the animal. And you'll see that beef actually has a pretty poor feed efficiency when we compare it to other animals. Um, milk is actually one of the highest feed efficiencies. It's very efficient to raise dairy cows. Um, fish, chicken, more efficient than beef. Um, but this is part of the reason that beef costs so much more because you do have to put in that much more feed and that much more other resources in order to raise the animal. When people are choosing certain breeds, they're also going to look a lot at conformation. And conformation of an animal is really looking at its shape. And we're looking at its shape for a couple reasons. One is we want it to fit the use that we're going to have for that animal. So you might have noticed that dairy cows look a lot skinnier than beef cattle. And beef cattle tend to have a much more square shape in their body, where dairy cattle are much more triangular. And that is very much on purpose. And that's because we're focusing the energy where we want to get that product. So the beef cattle are nice and square because that allows plenty of room for these big muscles that the meat are going to come from. Whereas the dairy cow, you really wanna focus that energy into milk production. And that's why you wind up with your much thinner body and more focus on that back area. So conformation is really important to consider with any animal, very important with horses as well, because you wanna make sure that their body shape is really suited for the work they're going to be doing. Another term that's going to be important here in a minute is we're gonna talk about different ways that beef cattle are raised. So one term that will come up in that is this process of weaning. And weaning is when an uh, animal basically stops nursing from their mother and they start eating solid foods. Um, so most cattle are weaned somewhere between six and eight weeks. Um, dairy cattle are actually separated from their mother after the first week after birth, and that's for their own immune system to be able to develop healthily um, because they do have so many cows in such a small environment. Um, but with a beef cow, they're usually left out in the pasture with their moms, and they're usually weaned naturally around six to eight weeks. That's when the mom would stop feeding them. And one thing that's really interesting that goes along with this is their whole digestive system really changes in this time, too. You can see when they're really young, their rumen is really small. But as they get older, that rumen grows and grows, and that's because they're starting to add more and more of those solid foods, those roughages like hay and grass, so they need a better ability to uh, digest that. Their abomasum, which is the closest to our stomach, actually gets smaller as they get older because they need that at the beginning when they're drinking milk as their main food source, which is much closer to our food sources, 
Um, but then as they mature, they don't really need that stomach to be as big anymore because they're not drinking that milk anymore. And then besides weaning, another important term when we talk about kind of the life cycle of a beef cow is going to be finishing. And finishing really refers to that last period of time before they are slaughtered where you're trying to increase their growth very quickly, increase the amount of muscle and increase the amount of fat to get them to market weight and to get the characteristics that you want in the particular meat. Um, so you hear a lot about grass-fed beef and that's kind of a misnomer because pretty much all beef is grass-fed in the first place. Most of their life, they're actually out grazing on the pasture and they usually don't get any additional food beyond that. Um, it's just in this finishing period that it differs. So meat can either be finished on grass where they stay in the pasture the whole time, or it can be finished on grain. And one of the benefits to that is a lot of people think it gives it a much more buttery, richer flavor. Um, and that's why most beef in the U.S. is grain finished. One last thing that is very important for beef producers, um, especially when they're selecting which particular animals they're going to breed, is this idea of expected progeny difference, or EPD. And we're going to talk a lot more about this later in the year. But basically, there are charts that um, people can use to predict what the offspring of particular crosses of animals are going to be like. So you can predict what their weight is going to be at weaning. You can predict what their carcass weight will be in the end and how much marbling they will have and all of that. So beef producers in particular really rely pretty heavily on these EPDs when they're trying to select, first of all, what breed they're going to raise, and then also what particular individuals of that breed they are going to cross with each other. So there's basically three main ways that beef production works in the United States. Um, and it's important to understand the differences between these types of operations. So there are operations that are called cow-calf operations. And basically these farms will breed mature cows really just for the purpose of producing calves. And then they sell these calves, they're known as feeder calves, and they get sold to other operations while they're still very young. And they don't really take charge of any of the actual raising of the calf at that point. They're really just involved in the breeding side of things. Then usually after a cow-calf operation, the calf will go to a feeder calf operation. And these farms don't usually keep any mature animals. They bind the weaned calves that are already separated from their mothers, they're eating on their own, and they raise them until it's time to finish them. So until they're usually around 500 pounds, they'll stay at the feeder calf operation, and then they'll go off to another operation to be finished. And usually they are finished in feedlots. So feedlots are intensive operations, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of animals in a very small area. Um, and because of that, a lot of people raise some environmental and welfare concerns about these types of farms. Um, but there are actually a lot of laws involved in making sure that the animals are treated um, humanely in these large environments. And they also have to follow a lot of different environmental rules as well, such as um, how they're going to deal with manure and that kind of thing. So they really don't deserve as bad a reputation as they've gotten. And the reason why feedlots are used so much is they're usually very close to transportation. It might be rail cars. Um, it might be that they are very close to the actual place that the animal will be harvested, the slaughterhouse. Um, and these are where animals are usually finished by feeding them grain until they reach that market weight so that they have the characteristics that we want. You may have noticed in Maryland, we don't really have any feedlots. Um, instead, our local beef operators are basically what we know as farmer feeders. So they raise their cattle all the way from birth through finishing. They take charge of the breeding and everything else that goes into that cow. One of the advantages of this is you'll find that these farmers usually care a lot about their cows because they've raised them their entire life. Um, and basically they're in charge of everything in the life of that cow. 
This wraps up the background information on beef breeds, so now go ahead and watch the next video to learn about the breeds themselves.